ahead and turn it over uh, to Dr. Valdez, and I'll talk to you guys at the end of tonight's session. Take care. Dr. Valdez, all yours. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, well, it is great to be here again with you all this evening um, or afternoon, depending on where you're at, um, at for this session on applying to and uh, selecting uh, graduate schools. I am Dr. Valdez. I am the director of the McNair Scholars Program at Wellesley College, where I'm also a faculty member in the biology department. Um, I study vascular biology and eye diseases, in case anybody wants to talk research with me. Um, and I am so, so so honored to be um, joined by an amazing panel. Also, I should share, I'm also an OK LSAM uh, alumni. So uh, as an undergraduate, I also participate in the LSAMP uh, program. Um, and so I'm very, uh, always, always wanting to represent. Uh, and so I'm excited to be here with you all tonight. And so I am going to ask uh, my panelists if they would go ahead and um, introduce themselves. And so um, uh, uh, I guess we'll start with Maria, if you wouldn't mind going first, oh, uh, just alphabetically. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Gonzalez. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I got my bachelor's in physics from Wellesley College in 2019 with a minor in women's and gender studies. Uh, currently, I am a rising second year PhD student at Virginia Tech in their engineering mechanics department. I study biomechanics, specifically the locomotion of flying snakes. So there are several species of snakes that fly. They are able to flatten out their bodies and glide through the air. And I'm using my physics degree to study how they do that and how they perform different maneuvers in the air. All right, and then we'll have Kayla. Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Titili Torres. I got my BS in zoology in 2016 from Washington State University, uh, where I was a McNair Scholar and an LSAM Scholar through the Pacific Northwest program. I'm currently entering my fifth year as a PhD candidate at University of Kentucky. I am in the molecular biology program and I am similar to Dr. Valdez, but I actually study how diseases affect eye development and the relationship between the fetus um, and the mother during pregnancy. And I think that's it. Thanks. All right, Rod. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Rodrig Bog. Born in Cameroon, Cameroon, Africa, raised all over Europe, lived in Canada, and now I'm in the US. So, special power, I can speak six different languages. And, uh, okay, so I got my bachelor, uh, my bachelor degree, BS in biochem with a minor in chemistry from the University of Iowa. And before that, I got my associate uh, from DMARC, urban campus in Des Moines. That was in biology. Then after that, uh, I did some work for the military, which I really like, and I decided to join. And uh, I finished with the military as a second lieutenant right now. And uh, I'm in my third year, PhD slash master's program, but hopefully PhD. And in my work, I'm, uh, I work in different areas, in thermobiology and uh, neurobio. So I'm trying to see how the temperature affects the response of uh, the crop gizzard of earthworm, how they respond to acetylcholine and how the temperature affects all that. And the goal is to see, is to see how since human, we have the same musculature with earthworm and we're trying to see how we can apply all that knowledge to study uh, neurodegenerative diseases and personally I want to apply that in the military and see how we can understand like the molecular phenomenon of PTSD in the future so thanks um, and Elon yes hello um, my name is Elon and I did my bachelor's of science engineering um, the specific Uh-oh. Did we lose you? Yeah, we may have lost her there. 
I know she was struggling with the connection, so we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and yeah. continue. Um, Elon uh, did her bachelor's um, in Arkansas, um, I think bioengineering. This is all, um, I, I worked with Elon, I wanna say six years ago. Um, and uh, and then she, she did her master's um, at Johns Hopkins uh, and I, I I'm going to mess up the program name, so I'm not going to say it, um, but uh, really, really cool uh, bioengineering stuff um, there, and she also had it funded, so keep that in mind, um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that as we continue, um, and so she joins in. We can have her do her full introduction um, and share a little more with us, She's but for here now. right now. Oh, she's back. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Our, the power went off in my house like 30 minutes ago, so my internet is pretty unstable, but I'll try to join by phone. I think that might be better. Um, but just, um, Kami, I think you touched a, a lot on my background. Yes, and we'll have you we'll have you dial in from your phone so we can get uh, a better sound because it is a little choppy right now. No problem. <laughs> All right, Dr. Valdez, you can continue there. So, um, before I jump into the rest of the slides, I just want to say a little bit about our. Um, about our uh, format for this evening. So um, we have some, I have some slides that I'll be going over some content and then I have some, you know, questions that I plan to pose to the panelists. Um, and at that time, we also want to pause for questions from the audience. So uh, you all will definitely be involved in the questions throughout. So don't feel like you have to wait till the end to ask questions. We're going to be asking questions um, throughout the session of our panelists. And um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started with the agenda. Um, and so um, we are going to be talking about getting started uh, with uh, graduate school applications. Um, and then we'll jump into uh, our second part is selecting a graduate school. So we're going to focus on the application, you know, itself and how to even get to the application and then um, selecting a graduate school. And so um, I think, let's see. Yep. Yeah. Nope, uh, we have a poll here, uh, Deb, that we want to ask um, of our audience. Perfect. So we'll give you all a couple minutes, or not quite minutes, maybe, uh, to answer this. Question is, how many graduate programs should you apply to? This is for our dial-in people. Thank you. No problem. And Dr. Valdez, are you seeing the results very well? I'm seeing the results, yes. Awesome. Perfect. So can, can you all see the results or no? Yes, I can. Um, what I did want to see is do, um, do all of our panelists, do all of our panelists, are you able to see the results as well? I can. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, yep. Here are our results. Um, so it looks like folks, uh, there's quite quite a quite a spread there on um, how many programs you all uh, think you should be applying to. Um, and so I will share with you um, uh, what. Uh, so so are these available now for the students to see? Brian. Yes, they were looking at them. And Everybody can see them. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> sorry. Um, so it looks like a majority of folks are saying, you know, up to five programs um, and then up to 10 looking like the next um, next biggest group, but three um, being uh, also in the mix. So, okay, so now we'll go into it. So um, before you actually begin the application process, and what I mean by that is that you download the application and you start filling in your information and, um, you know, start answering the questions that the schools have, you should identify at least eight to 10 um, programs and schools that you are interested in applying to. 
So eight to 10, um, you know, is, is really the goal here. Um, and at each of those programs or schools, um, so sometimes you may apply to multiple programs within a school, which is why I'm, I'm giving a distinction there. So sometimes there might be a school that you're just like, I really want to get into that school. And there's so many cool faculty there doing exciting research that I need to be on that campus. So you may end up applying to two different programs because you could fit into either of them. Um, so it's, you you know, programs or schools. Um, and then you want at least three faculty in each program, uh, you know, that you are applying to that you're interested in because any number of things could happen um, to those faculty. So if you only had one choice um, and that lab didn't work out for you for whatever reason, um, you know, you wouldn't have anybody else there that you would want to work with and that would not be a great fit. Um, and so sometimes I do get questions about what, um, what are those reasons that a faculty might not be able to work with you. Um, one could be that the lab space is already full. They just already have too many students or postdocs working with them that they, they physically don't have space or the projects don't have space to have additional members. Um, funding is another issue um, that, you know, folks might not have enough funding to support an additional graduate student. Um, it could be, uh, you know, that your, um, Ad advisor, um, you know, or that the person that you want to work with um, is going to be retiring soon. They're going to be going emeriti, and so um, that wouldn't be a good fit because they can't be there for the entirety of your um, time in that graduate program. Um, or it could turn out that you join that lab and find out that it's not a good fit for you. Um, so you want to have other options of folks that you could work with um, in the event that that person who's your number one doesn't doesn't work out. Um, and then we also, um, it's really important to be organized about this process. Um, when, when you're talking about eight to 10 different programs, everybody has slightly different requirements. Um, you know, one of the things that is different about the graduate school application process um, versus say medical school is that medical school has a common application. So you fill out your demographics and you fill out, you know, like your address and all of those things one time and then all the other stuff, you know, goes to, to all the medical schools you're applying to. When you're applying for, you know, PhD and master's degrees, um, each school is going to ask you those same questions in slightly different ways. Um, and so you have to fill that out a lot of different times. And so you want to know what are the questions that they're asking? What's different about each of these? And we'll talk just a little bit more about this um, in, a, in a few slides. And then you also want to be lining up your recommenders. So um, you want to give your recommenders plenty of time to work on those letters so that they can give you the best possible uh, recommendation uh, for your graduate programs. And so I, here I have a question of our panelists. Um, so how many programs did you apply to um, when you were applying for graduate school? And uh, anybody can, you know, I'd like to hear from all four of you, but whoever wants to start can. I, I mean, I'll go. Okay, Brad, go ahead. Okay. I mean, personally, I applied to seven programs. Okay. Seven programs. And uh, it took me like a long time to, do I not, do I have to cite the program? No, you don't have to say them. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Maria, go ahead. You, you were next. I applied to um, 11 programs. Initially, I applied to 10. Um, then I made the mistake of looking at the rankings. And so I had applied to only top 30 programs, panicked, and sent out one more application. <laughs> and was that extra one necessary? It did not end up being necessary, no. Okay. Uh, Elon? Um, yeah, I applied to, I think it was five um, graduate programs, and all the ones I applied to were master's. Um, that was my goal, just to go into get my master's first and then um, see how I liked it, and um, then go into industry after that. So um, the five I applied to were specific to innovation and design, which was my focus for um, bioengineering. So. Yeah. See, that's always what I mess up in, in your degree is the innovation and design. Um, yes, my master's. Yeah, with, mm -hmm. Right, with the global aspect. Um, yep. uh, and then Kayla? 
Um, I applied to seven. My original list was eight. And I like that you really made the point about listing three faculty. I ended up having to cut one from my list because two of the faculty were entering that emeritus or emerita, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, stage in their career. So they couldn't take me on. So it was really important to have those conversations early on. Otherwise, I would have wasted my time of putting all that effort into that last school. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just see if there's any questions from our audience just in talking about like number of schools or, or, um, you know, uh, anything on this, we're going to dive deeper. So you don't have to ask everything right now. Um, but if there's any questions, um, if folks want to raise their hand or put it in the chat box, um, we'll wait just a couple seconds um, to see if anybody has anything for us at this stage for questions. If you'd like to ask a question about this at all, just use the raise your hand feature. All right, Heavenly. Hi, um, so my question is um, to the graduates. Um, when did you guys know that you wanted to go to graduate school? Great question. Um, for me, I actually started as a pre-med um, in my freshman, sophomore year, I was going on the pre-med track and then I realized that I really enjoyed the engineering aspect of um, my degree and I wanted to continue in um, design and um, in the science field as um, an engineer. And so I think that was kind of my end of sophomore year, beginning of junior year, I kind of made sure that I wanted to to go down the right path instead of wasting time later on. Um, and that was kind of just my, my desire just to be like an engineer. And, when, and I realized that my, um, my undergrad was kind of broad, so I wanted to specify a little bit more with my master's degree. How about anyone, anyone, any other panelists like to, to share on that question? Sure. Okay. I mean, personally, I decided to go to grad school. I knew that I wanted to go to grad school after uh, I took the MCAT and I went to visit, like, talk to a shadow some medical student. I saw, like, how, what they were doing because medical school, according to what I saw, was like a lot of reading. You have a test every end of the week and there is a lot of other stuff you have to do. And I was like, personally, I don't like being sick and I don't like being around like sick people. So I just guess, yeah, medical school is not for me. So I went, I took the GRE. I did good right after like, right after my junior year, I took the GRE and I started being involved in research. And at that time I knew that I wanted to go to grad school. That's right. Uh I was originally pre-vet and my first animal science class my freshman year, they made me artificially inseminate a pig without gloves. And like, that was just it for me. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna be a vet. This is clearly not for me. Like, I, nope, no thank you. Uh, and so I talked to my advisor and they told me based on my first semester grades that I wasn't gonna get into any professional schools either. And so I tried my hand at research uh, because I was an LSAMP and I um, was thinking about McNair. Um, and I found out that that research was a way that I could be really creative and really explore science in a way that um, I felt was like, interesting and it, it never got boring in the lab I was always getting to try new things and so my PI basically told me that you know this could be your career you could spend your life really just exploring questions that interest you and so that really drove me to go to graduate school rather than keep trying to look at other professional schools and I was scared to get a job so <laughs> Maria did you have one yeah um so I started research pretty early on um, because I thought it was interesting, but grad school was not on my radar. I was a physics major and I knew I wasn't into quantum. So I, I knew that physics grad school was definitely just not an option for me at all. Um, so then at the end of my junior year, I stayed on campus an extra couple of weeks with my um, advisor mentor PI to help him with some class stuff and before I left he said um right before you go I'd like to like have lunch with you like wrap up this year talk about how excited you are for the summer and just like say goodbye and I said okay 
we went out, he paid for my meal, and as soon as our food comes, we're sitting down, he goes, so have you considered graduate school? And I was like, you tricked me. And he said, I totally did. Um, so he bribed me with food to talk about grad school. And he made like a compromise with me, like, look this summer, see if you have any research that you are interested in at all um, in doing a senior thesis. And if you get really interested in anything at all, we'll make sure that you can do it in our department and we can start talking about grad school. So that was the summer I dis discovered biomechanics and flying snakes. So I called him up and I was like, I'll do a senior thesis if you can let me do it in flying snakes. And he was like, okay, we can make that happen. He suggested I applied for McNair and that was it. Dr. Valdez helped me get on track and now I'm doing um, a PhD in flying snakes. So it really was a guy sitting down and bribing me with food to think about it, to get me on board with that, but it did work. <laughs> Sometimes faculty and advisors know uh, before you do. So um, thank you all for those answers. And so we'll um, go ahead and move on with the presentation and then we'll get back into the Q&A a little more um, as we continue. So uh, one of the things as you get prepared um, to consider applying to grad school is that you, re you have to really do your research on the graduate schools. And so there's a number of um, considerations that, you know, factors that you need to consider. So um, one is um, a topic. Uh, so, um, and Maria just gave a fantastic example of that, right? Flying snakes is what motivated her. That's the air, air, motivated them, apologies. Um, you know, motivated them and, uh, you know, wanted them, you know, that, that they really wanted to study. And so then you find what schools have flying snakes research, right? Um, so, so, you have to figure out like what is a topic maybe that you want to be studying and if you aren't certain um which you don't have to be as narrow as maria um and know exactly you know the topic that you want to go into um if your topic's more broad then that might also open up the number of schools that you're looking at then we also talked a little bit about faculty and and kayla made a great point about this that um you know the faculty may change um you know from what you initially list um in your applications but you want to identify faculty that you're interested in working with um based on the, you know your research interests but also um you know your mentors may have recommendations the folks that you're working with like science is a very small field like it's it's incredibly small um you know and you don't think it is until you know something happens um you know i was talking with a colleague um you know earlier this this summer and she uh she had said um she's like your research sounds really familiar um and then it turned out that she had been at a talk that i gave um and in a small world it's it's just like it's such a such a small world um you know she was like how do i know anything about your research and then she's like wait i saw you at, a, at another conference um so it's very small. So your your faculty members, they're already in the area that you're interested in conducting research and they will know people who you should consider for your, um, you know, dissertation or a thesis advisor. Um, and then that'll also steer you towards programs and schools that might be um, of interest to you. So use that network um, to, to help you um, figure that out. Um, Another consideration, um, you know, this is real, uh, time to completion, right? When you're thinking about, um, you know, the, the master's degree is finite. It's either a one year or two years master. But if you're thinking about the PhD, that's an open-ended, you know, timeline, right? Um, let's see, three of our four panelists talked about potentially going to professional school initially, and those all have real, real end times, you know, it's, four years for medical school, you know that going into it, right? Um, but the PhD is open-ended and it's when your project is done. And so that um, can can be unsettling, um, but at the same sense, um, you will finish. So don't worry about it, you will finish. Um, you know, but some, some programs have better time to degree, um, you know, and so you might wanna know that going into it. Is the average five years or 5.5? Is it six? Are people more seven? You know, so, so that matters. And, and you might want to find out if it is seven years, why is it taking students seven years to, to, to graduate? Is it that a majority of their students go on to become faculty and they actually have really phenomenal 
track records of publishing during those seven years and that's why they take the additional year is to just go ahead and publish or is it that there's something happening in that program that's really extending it for some reason so you might that might be a factor in, in what you're thinking about about the graduate schools another one um, is location um, and uh, you know that I think again this entire this entire um, slide is all about things that are really personal to you um, when you're choosing your graduate school and what matters to you. Um, and so location, um, you know, you could be very interested in living in, um, you know, a city and wanting to be in a very metropolis type setting, or it could be that you really want to be close to your family, close to your parents, or um, it could be that you have a partner um, who has already secured, um, you know, either a place in grad school or a job or a position in a certain town and you're trying to you know match um, and, and match up with them um, so I think that location matters. I have colleagues who disagree with me um, one of my colleagues would say oh um, you know you're gonna be in the lab does it matter where where you're uh, where where you're at but I think that your happiness you know is is important um, and that location adds to that happiness and and that you have the supports in that town or near you um, to be able to do um, you know your research and be successful in that um, funding um, and we're going to talk more about funding and there's a whole session on funding next week um, the session next week uh, next Wednesday same time same place um, is is going to be entirely on funding but um, the funding is also a consideration like what type of funding packages are they offering are they offering funding for the entirety of your degree? Um, and um, what what are the conditions? And there's there's uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the presentation. And then um, similarly uh, on the other supports, um, whether it's support services that the institution offers, um, the type of curriculum that they have, any unique aspects of the program that really make it um, something that you're interested in or that the school has that makes it really interesting to you. Um, those are going to be things that also might draw you to this program. Um, and so uh, there is a poll here now um, that Deb's going to put up and it asks, which of these factors are you planning to most consider when applying to graduate schools? And you can, um, it looks like it's set up for maybe multiple choice. I don't know if that means, we'd hope that you could select up to three, but I'm not sure if you'll be able to. Yes, students should be able to select up to three. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you can tell this is really right good participation. Yeah, great yeah. participation. Thank you all. Okay, we got about 20 more of you. Think, think fast. And give it just maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, I think that's probably good. All right, so um, thank you all for participating. Um, and it looks like uh, most people are thinking about funding. Uh, money matters. Um, you know, you have to be able to uh, live and um, and and be able to actually do your education. So um, it's great that you're thinking about that. And then it looks like next after that is the location um, and topic and. Um, followed by faculty and the faculty and topic are kind of tied, um, tied together, um, that is. And then we'll also, um, the uh, next question for our panelists is, is which of those factors were um, most important to them when they were choosing uh, their graduate programs. And so I'll ask you to be really fast because we are short on time already, if you can imagine that. I can go ahead and start Thanks, that Maria. one. Um, so the most important factor to me, and I made this very clear with the people that I was like talking to when I was going in, was I wanted mentorship and I wanted in some capacity diversity, which is not something you'll always get from like your program specifically, but I did ask um, professors like how I hold some intersecting identities, how do you plan to support that? Um, so some things like I, our department's not 
great about diversity, but our lab is. So when I interviewed and I saw everyone there and I talked to them and they talked to me about their experiences, that's what made me feel really safe. Um, I'm a New Horizons graduate scholar, which is like a community of all of the um, all of the underrepresented female or other identity holding engineering students. And we have like lunch, we do peer groups of like writing groups and reading groups and stuff. And that was something that I knew was going to be really important to me to finish because I think it's really important to think not like which one am I going to get into, but which one is going to support me to the finish line and beyond. Um, I wanted a mentor. So something that worked out really well was a postdoc was coming into Jake's lab at the same time I was and she is, um, Latino and queer and a great mentor for me. So I knew I'd always have someone to talk to who had just like done it before. So I got really lucky in that regard. Um, so faculty topic, I do want to make it clear that I didn't exclude, there aren't 10 places I don't think that study flying snakes, but I knew I wanted to do biomechanics. So um, if a place didn't offer that, I wasn't going to do it and I ruled out like I have a degree in physics I ruled out like all physics graduate programs because I'm like if, if I am not super passionate about my work then I'm not going I know myself I won't be able to motivate myself um, so definitely um, definitely mentorship and mentorship topic and um, programming were my big ones for applying to graduate school Thank you. And then maybe we'll take one more uh, panelist response for this one and then we'll go ahead and move on. Um, for me, yeah, um, it was definitely the topic. Um, I did my undergrad in biomedical engineering and I knew I wanted the master's, but I didn't want it to be another like broad type of um, engineering degree. Um, so I wanted a program that specifically focused on um, innovation and like designing um, devices, medical devices, like on the mechanical side of things. And I wanted to, to tie with global health and international development um, and a, a program that allowed me to travel abroad and experience different cultures, which is what I love to do. Um, and so this program at Hopkins was um, perfect for me to combine both the engineering side and the international development side. And there were only a handful, like five of these programs in the US. So I just applied to all of them because they were exactly what I um, was looking for. So topics was definitely a um, factor for me. And thank you. Um, okay, and then uh, something else, uh, just as you prepare to apply to grad school, and I think that our panelists have already, you know, touched on this a little bit, is the networking um, and, and that making those connections, and again, the scientific world is very small, um, you know, make lots of connections, um, you know, we are, um, you know, living in very different times or that we're doing this in Zoom um, and that that's become our new norm. But um, it also presents some opportunities. You know, you can attend more virtual conferences and meet faculty um, at those conferences. You could reach out to have a Zoom call and that would be normal. Like it wouldn't be a weird request for you to say, hey, I'd love to talk about your research. Um, you know, could we have a Zoom call? Um, You'll want to talk as you're thinking about what grad schools that you're interested in, you know, talk to your faculty mentor. I already mentioned that um, your program director, um, you know, your LSAM for McNair uh, program director can help you. Um, career services at your school um, may also be another resource. Um, alumni or alumni of your institution um, can also be a good resource if you have like a database to be able to look up like who has gone to grad school, um, reach out to them because you know, they, they are folks who are wanting to help you. Um, and then LSAM uh, community or your McNair community, um, alums of that, or just broadly, like if you find somebody who's um, an LSAM alum, uh, you know, who's out of school that you're interested in, say, hey, I'm an LSAM scholar, I'd love to talk to you, and they will make time for you, I, I can guarantee it. Um, and so just reach out to people, use this network, you really, you have a lot at your fingertips, and so um, make sure that you make use of that. And then the getting organized, and um, I uh, will uh, have a, a 
this is actually an Excel sheet, so it's not really meant for you all to read it in detail here. Um, I know it's a very small font, but I wanted to give you kind of an idea of what this spreadsheet is. Um, and uh, Deb will be able to share this after the event um, with the follow-up materials. But this is um, a spreadsheet that I've designed for my scholars and my students that I've worked with over the years um, to help them get organized with the application process. Um, and so you can organize it by the deadline of the, um, you know, the applications, you list what school it is, what's the program or department that you're applying to, who are the faculty at that institution that you're most interested in, because when you start looking at 20 schools, you're not going to remember the specifics of who it is, and then you have to do that research all over again. Um, um, writing down any um, um, unique uh, aspects of the program that make it special um, for you and why it would be a great um, uh, why why it might be a great fit for you um, the statement of purpose length um, other essays because schools always have these extra essays once you start the application there's like bonus essays that you're like that wasn't on your website um, and then the number of le uh, letters of recommendation that they require who are you planning to ask to write those letters and it might vary a little bit by program so if you're gonna be um, you know um, if you're like me I was at the crux of chemistry and biology so sometimes I might pull in more chemists and sometimes I might pull in more biologist or a biochemist um, and so there might be slight differences you're probably gonna have a core of you know two that'll probably be the same for the whole thing but maybe that third person alternates depending on your program that you're applying to um, you also um, can use this um, to actually share with your faculty mentors. Um, so you could put the links here for where that they um, would actually upload their letter if the links are available on the website. Some of them will send a link to them, but you could let them know that, that they're gonna get an email that says like, here's where you upload your letter. Um, what's the application fee? Um, is there a fee waiver that you can get? A lot of institutions provide fee waivers for um, McNair, LSAMP scholars, Mellon Mays fellows, etc. Um, and so find out about that um, and what that mechanism is. Sometimes your director has to write a letter for you or provide a document that says that you were part of that program and then they'll go ahead and waive that for you. Um, and sometimes it's that you have to email a specific person, but um, this, this um, spreadsheet will hopefully help you get organized and feel free to edit it to make it work for you. Um, but I hope that it's something that will help you in that process. Um, and then the timeline. So um, this is one slide representing like a whole year. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, I'm, I'm condensing it into one slide for you um, in the interest of time for this presentation. But um, in short, um, if you are a senior and applying for graduate school, this is what your year will look like. So in the fall, you're going to be taking the GRE if you haven't already. And again, this is a weird year. Remember, we're, we're in the room remote world. Um, and so many schools may not be requiring the GRE um, because it is a weird year. Um, and so you want to know that up front, whether or not that's going to be required. Do know that there is a fee waiver that you can get from, um, you know, um, potentially from, you know, I know in McNair, uh, the directors have fee waivers for uh, to, to get the tests for 50% off. Um, so ask you know, your director if they might have access to that. You can also search it on the ETS website, um, which is the, the company that runs GRE. Um, there's also a website called uh, grenotrequired.com. Um, and that will tell you um, about all of the schools that do not require the GRE. Um, so there's a lot of data out there that shows that the the GRE is not um, is is not as predictive as one would hope um, for success in graduate school and particularly in STEM um, and so uh, there are many schools that are moving away from that and so at that website GRE not required there's some faculty who've been putting it together um, that list all of the programs. So, um, and again, this year's gonna be weird. So definitely be checking the websites for the schools that you're applying to. Um, again, in the fall, you're identifying those schools, which is what we're talking about. Um, and then you're gonna start applying um, and apply, you know, there it's just five letters for the word apply, but it's so much work that's gonna go into that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue. Um, and then over the winter, so, you know, starting in, um, 
probably, you know, January or, or uh, late January, early February, um, there will be interviews for the graduate programs. Um, and uh, you'll, they might be over Zoom. Um, you know, usually they're on campus, but this year they might be over Zoom. Um, and by then you all will be pros at Zoom and so it won't be a big deal for you. Um, but you'll have your interviews in the spring, then you have to make some decisions once these offers start rolling in and everybody's so excited to accept you into their graduate program, you've got to make some decisions. And then over the summer, uh, you know, you can uh, relax, right? You can take a break because you're about to start graduate school and you've got a lot that's going to be going on after that. Um, some po folks might be finishing up research. Um, and trying to get that publication out or wrapping up their projects. Um, and then finally in the fall, you're gonna be starting graduate school um, in 2021. Um, and so um, we'll be, we'll all be excited for you at that point. Um, and we do have a poll here. We, I wanted to ask specifically uh, the seniors a question. And so for our rising seniors, uh, what do you plan to do with your summer uh, next year in 2021? And the options are to finish up your research, relax and rest pre-grad school, travel the world, begin early graduate research rotations, or work. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you have to be a senior to do the poll? You could fill it out if you'd like to. Yeah, I, I just filled it out because okay, no worries. I, I didn't know if, sorry. No, you're fine. We'll get a couple more seconds. Looks like we might be stalled out for our seniors that are responding. Perfect. All right, so work is is a majority of the folks. Um, you know, we, we all have to work to survive. Although for a second there, travel the world was really strong, and I can understand that given the current climate that that we all want to get out there and travel. Um, but yeah, work um, looks like not so many of you want to be doing research in that summer before grad school, and that's okay too because you deserve deserve a little bit of a break because you'll be doing that for for a long time to come. All right, so let's see. Okay, um, and so uh, just a little bit about the application components. Again, this is a ton of information in one tiny slide. Um, so the components, um, I, I always include the fact that the online application because um, people really don't give it much thought, um, but it takes a lot of time to fill out that demographic information eight, 10, 11 times. Um, and then there's also extra essays there. Um, so they might ask for like, in 250 words or less, do this. And 60 words or less, tell us about this. Um, you know, they might ask for a diversity essay. They might ask for, um, uh, you know, tell us about any, um, I don't know, anything that's not included in your application that you think we should know. Like there's a number of different things that can kind of be embedded into this like online application that's not the like normal upload. So, so I want to just stress how much time goes into that component so that you are thinking about that up front and make sure that you start that piece early because a lot of that you can do um, without a ton of prep work. And so um, you want to start that early. And then um, transcripts, um, you know, in, in today's uh, climate, most schools just require the unofficial transcript until you are admitted. Um, and once you are admitted, um, then they will ask for those official transcripts. Um, the letters of recommendation. So you'll have to be entering your recommenders. And when you enter your recommenders, it likely will send an email to your recommender. So you want to have asked your recommender before you enter their name um, so that they know that that's going to be coming to them. Um, the personal statement or statement of purpose, um, you know, this uh, the statement, you know, they, they're the same thing. They're one in the same. It depends on the school, what they call them. Um, this is really misleading in its name. Um, the, the personal statement or statement of purpose is actually a, um, it's a research statement, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a 
a, a look at what research you have done as an undergraduate. Um, and then it's a look forward at what is the research that you hope to do as a graduate student um, and who are the people that you hope to work with. And, and it's also a sales pitch. Like, why are you a good match for this program? How are you prepared for this program? Um, and like, how are you a good fit? Um, so, you know, this, this is going to, you know, be really important for you to put some time um, and effort in. And this is not a one draft and done. This is going to be many, many, many iterations um, before you're submitting it. And then um, we already talked about GREs a little bit. Um, but the GRE uh, may be part of the application. Um, and so there's the general exam, which is um, somewhat similar in format to like an SAT, where it has a quantitative reasoning and a verbal reasoning um, section, and then it has a writing section. Um, but some schools do require subject tests. Um, that's typically more um, common in the physical fields, um, but um, depends on the program um, whether or not they might require that. And so you want to know that up front because that's a separate exam. And so I'm going to ask the uh, panelists here, um, what application components were the most important for admission into your program and why? And so um, maybe we can have Rod and Kayla answer this time um, since you didn't get to an answer the last time. Sure. So I was, when I went to interview, uh, every faculty that I interviewed with actually told me that my statement of purpose was uh, really struck out to them. I actually talked about how when I was a kid, I wanted to be a party planner. And I wanted to be a party planner because I felt creative, I was really organized, and I was really thoughtful about the things that I did. And I really wanted something that was always new and exciting. Um, and when I got to undergrad, I realized that all of those things apply to research in their own way. Uh, and the product, instead of a party, you get to create knowledge. And that was something that none of the faculty I applied to had even thought of. Uh, they told me that they thought that that made me a really unique and creative candidate. And so I felt like really taking that time to talk about how who I am applies to the science world, not necessarily just science that, you know, I'm a whole person, but every aspect of who I am makes me a good scientist and makes me a strong researcher. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, my computer first, the personal computer just went off, so I'm using another computer and you cannot see me. Sorry about that. Uh, personally, the most important component I had, I would say, I would say it was my personal statement because everywhere I apply, those faculty, they actually send me email. They're not the, because when I put my application, my personal statement, I stated exactly what I wanted to do, why I wanted to do that, and what, why I wanted to do that, and who I wanted to work with. And uh, most of those faculty, they actually contacted, them, contacted me and they called me over there for an interview. So when I went there, they had my statement. They actually wanted me to talk about everything I say in my statement, why I would be a good fit, what I'm planning to do with like, whatever I'm going to get there and what I can bring to the lab. To the lab. So that was kind of the most important piece for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure other panelists could add to this, but in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and move move on. And so thank you both for those responses. And so now we're going to move into the section about selecting a graduate school. Um, and again, we'll be able to ask our panelists some questions along the way. And so the first is, okay, so now we've applied to graduate school and you get this email or you, yeah, you get an email that says, you know, congratulations, you've admitted, you've been admitted to the school of your dreams. Um, now what? Right? Um, so what do you do after you get that letter? And so the first thing I would say is read everything, read everything that they send you and then read it again. Um, and so what do I mean about, you know, these things that they're sending you? So they're going to send you a ton of information. And so there's going to be things um, in the materials that they send about the program requirements, um, any other paperwork that they require of you and what deadlines that they might be expecting you to get those things back to them. 
the official transcript. Remember I mentioned you're probably only sending the unofficial up front. Now they want that official transcript. So you've got to make sure you connect with your registrar's office and get that request going. Um, they're going to give you information about your funding package and we'll spend some more time on that in just a second. Um, they're going to be um, sending you information about housing and what options there might be on campus or um, off campus um, that they have through the institution. Um, they're going to be sending information about the campus visits. Um, so if we're able to go in person, um, they're going to be sending information about those campus visits or it may be virtual and it might be um, a couple days over Zoom um, of, you know, visiting the campus virtually. They're also going to send information about other resources or they might have um, students that actually reach out and connect with you. Um, to talk about their experiences. Um, and then finally, they are also going to send you a deadline for which you have to make a decision. So are you going to accept that offer or are you going to reject it? And so you need to make sure that you are reading everything so that this is not you. Um, so I don't want anybody that's on this call to be um, the person with their head in the sand and who's missed that information or somehow critically misses um, an important deadline that means that you won't get your funding or that you won't get to go to that school of your dreams. And so um, this will not be you. Um, you're going to be reading everything. Um, and so then the next piece is really about reviewing that funding package. So what are they offering? Um, and so uh, we're starting on the left, you know, um, are they providing funding? And so if they are, um, then we go in the top part, the blue part of this slide, um, you want to find out how many years are they providing funding for? So some schools might offer five years, some might say, you know, until completion, some might, you know, it depends on, on the program, how much funding that they're offering, and you want to make sure that you know that. Um, and what is the mechanism in which they're providing that funding? Is it through a teaching assistantship? Is it through research assistantship? Or is it some combination of both? Um, and then if it is teaching, um, I, I do want to make sure that you think about um, how are these teaching assignments actually assigned? Um, or, um, you know, is it the department says this is what you're teaching? Um, is it going to be your PI that says this is what you're teaching? Or do you have to go out there and hustle and find those opportunities yourself by connecting with faculty and saying, hey, I heard that you're teaching, um, you know, this really cool course on, um, you know, I development. Um, and I really want to, I really want to be your, uh, your teaching assistant. Um, do you have space, right? Um, and and are they guaranteed? So that's a, another question. So it's not just that they offer it, but is it guaranteed for you for those years that you need that for your funding? If it's research-based um, assistantship, uh, you want to find out whether or not that's through the department. So sometimes the department will pay for a couple of the years um, of your um, stipend for the program. Um, and then sometimes it's that your lab is going to pay. Um, and are are these limited to specific labs? So is it whoever has the grant for that, uh, you know, whoever has the funding to be able to pay for you? Um, or is this something, is there a training grant that the department has that's going to cover you? So um, these are just some questions uh, to keep in mind as you think about what funding is offered and how it is offered because um, all funding packages are not created equal. Um, and so you do have to be asking these questions and really reading through those details. Um, and panelists, stay tuned because I'm going to be asking you a question about that um, in, in the next slide. Um, so if they're not providing funding, you also, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to totally count that program out of, you know, the running. Um, so you want to be looking at, um, you know, what scholarships do they offer? You know, do they have scholarships? So maybe this is the, you know, the funding isn't guaranteed, but there are scholarships that either they offer to, you know, select students. Um, and do you have to apply separately? So sometimes, again, that's, that goes back to the read everything. So sometimes there are um, scholarships that you're eligible for, but you actually have to put in an application for it separately from your application to the program. Um, there's also fellowships that, you know, you could be applying for that are, you know, local, state, national, um, you know, that you can apply for fellowships to fund your graduate school. Um, and so those are also things to be keeping in mind. Um, you could also see if you're eligible to teach for pay. So um, even though it's not guaranteed or part of your package, you could be asking, um, you know, do they allow for, you know, whether it's your as a master's student or as a PhD student, do they allow you 
you to teach for pay um, to be able to make up some of that income um, and help you uh, defray those costs. Um, and then kind of the last approach is this financial aid because financial aid means loans. Um, and I just want to make that clear that when you talk about financial aid, so funding packages, you know, we're talking about money that they're giving you. Financial aid is money that you're taking out that you will owe back. Um, so you want to then see what other, what are the financial aid packages that they um, are offering. So um, with that, I will, um, oh, it's not on the next slide. I'll be asking you all in just a second. So now you have a decision point. Um, and so can you afford to go um, to graduate school once you know all of that funding information? And I'll just remind you all, this is a slide from my previous presentation um, earlier this summer where we talked about uh, the, the different rates of pay over a career of doctoral, of bachelor's, master's, and doctoral um, uh, degree holders um, and what the difference in earnings is over a career. So um, the master's degree will earn at least um, or on average uh, half a million dollars more over the course of their career and uh, doctoral degree holders will earn $1.3 million more over the course of their career um, which is 50% additional earnings. So then my question to you is can you afford not to go? right? Um, because this is a big difference in your earning potential for your um, lifespan and could make a really big difference to your family and to your future family and um, for generations to come. So um, now here's a question finally uh, for my panelists about what did your funding package look like um, and uh, what were the things that you considered as you weighed your options um, of the different packages that you were considering at the different schools? So um, if we can keep the answers brief but informative, that would be amazing. So um, maybe we'll start with Elon. We haven't heard from you in a while. Sure. Um... So my master's program was um, not funding, there was no funding package with it, but I did apply for scholarships and I did reach out to the program managers about any opportunities and they were super helpful. Um, and I ended up getting um, basic, almost all of the tuition and everything I needed paid for because I asked, because I reached out to the program manager. Um, and I think that's the first step to take if you don't have any, if no one, uh, none of the programs are offering any kind of funding. Um, just reach out, email, um, find our email addresses. Anybody who's um, managing administration of that program, um, I'm sure they would be able to help you, put you in the right direction. Um, and I, I also ended up doing a TA position. So I was um, assisting the undergrad design studio when I was um, in my grad program. So that was an additional resource I was able to take on after um, starting my program. Thanks, Alan. Um, Maria, would you be up for going next? Uh, sure. Um, so initially, when I got into my program, the letter I got um, guaranteed four years of funding through the department on research. So my department's a little strange. I feel like a lot of departments feel like um, have like their, their first year grad students TA and then you earn research later on. Our department really looks to put people in um, professor positions if they want to. So they reserve the TA positions for later on for when you decide I want to go into academia so that you can kind of hone your teaching skills and learn about that. So RA for your first years are really um, common. And then as I kind of waited to make a decision, I think there were some, there were people in the department who started nominating me for different fellowships. So my first year fellowship that I'm on is actually the graduate school sets aside money for one year for a, someone who's a McNair Scholar in their undergrad. So um, my first year is funded because grad schools really want McNair Scholars and other diversity type programs. And then I'm also part of a fellowship that tends to pay for people's first year, but my um, advisor argued that it should go on my second year. So I participate in my first year and I'm getting paid from it for my second year. That's like a biology engineering interdisciplinary program that I did rotations for and training for. So that pays for my second year. So those two fellowships are paying for my first two years. And then the four years that I was initially guaranteed rolled over. Um, so that's six years. But I'm also going to be applying for fellowships like the NSF and the NDSEG coming up soon because 
more money, more flexibility, and more um, th their awards. So if you're getting paid through those, they can be considered really prestigious and help you get jobs later on. So I'm still going to be applying for a lot of fellowships, but I do have the six years. So that was very that was very good for my decision making process is knowing that people were nominating me and making sure that I was going to get paid for my duration of my PhD. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Kayla? Yeah, so I made sure to ask what kind of fellowships, whether it's in the department or at the university that the program offers. And so they had a lot of, uh, well, they didn't have a lot of options, um, but the fellowships that they did offer were. Um, were for a good amount of funding and a good amount of time. And so I was fairly, my advisor and I talked early on and we were fairly confident in my CV um, and we really wanted to see how my first year went. And so I've ended up getting every fellowship my department offers and a few that my university offers. And so while I was guaranteed six years of teaching at every place I apply, um, I've only had to teach one and a half semesters so far. And so I also, when applying, I really thought about how much that costs compared to what the cost of living is. And and so, you know, I, I'm at University of Kentucky where the salary for my department is 22000 a year. Um, and it, I went also interviewed at Florida International University in Miami where it's only 24000 So I figured, you know, $2,000 difference, but living in Lexington versus living in Miami, Florida is a huge difference. And so I made sure to really weigh out what the cost of living like is in that area. Because even if the stipend is slightly higher, it might not make much of a difference when you consider where you are. Thank you. Uh, Rod? Yeah, I mean, my package, it was kind of straightforward because the letter acceptance, they said, I mean, the letter they sent me where they accepted me, they, they were talking about a guarantee four years of teaching. So I would get some money teaching and then the other two years I would work with my advisor depending on the funding he has. So I was getting money through the department, but with the right now yeah it's out of the picture but i was getting money through the department for teaching and uh, but they were not funding me in the summer in the summer i had to help to help uh, the trio trio program i was working there as a graduate supervisor writing a science curriculum for the student they were working with okay thank you all right um okay just a couple more uh slides and we'll also um have our audience chime in um as you all have questions too so um don't forget to to be uh adding those to the q a um box and raising your hands if, if you want to ask some questions too um so another part of selecting the grad school is that campus visit um and so you want to travel to that place if you can again we're in the remote world so it might not happen this year um, but if you are able to um, it is great to get on campus to um, see the resources to hear um, from the folks about their experience and to actually you know get to meet with the graduate students and see their experience find out you know are, are they happy with their choice um, you know are they happy in their program and graduate school students are always willing to be um, very candid um, about their experience and so you will get the real deal from them um, so you want to be asking those questions um, and you, um, you know, if, if uh, your, your visits are remote and you aren't given an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with graduate students, you know, you might reach out to folks that are in the labs that you're interested in and say, you know, can we have a virtual coffee? Um, you know, can we meet over Zoom or Google Hangout or FaceTime, whatever, um, to, to talk about your experience and your in the program, but also in that lab. Um, so you wanna be taking those, but I will give a word of caution that, you know, um, if you, you know, are in your senior year um, and you're still trying to complete your senior year and you're going to do these campus visits, they are very exhausting. So they're usually two to three days, um, usually, you know, stocked Friday to Sunday, something like that. Um, and, um, you know, they are exhausting because you are on the entire time. You're interviewing, you're meeting with faculty, you're meeting with people who are running the program, you're meeting with graduate students. Um, you know, they're going to take you out to dinner and, and want, you know, to talk your ear off and hear all about you. And, um, 
and then you've still got finals, right? Or you've still got assignments going on at your home institution. And so, um, you know, I I recommend going, you know, if you're invited to, to a lot of interviews, um, try to really narrow it down to your top, um, you know, four, I feel like is really about the most that people can really do without feeling complete exhaustion. Um, and so, uh, I want to check with our panelists um, and hear uh, what did you learn from visiting the campuses um, and what do you wish you had asked but did not during those grad uh, campus visits. So um, let's see, maybe we'll start backwards. Rod, would you be willing to go first? Uh, yes. I mean, the part of my decision, the biggest part of my decision was talking to like face to face with my mentor. That was a big part. But the funny thing is, uh, the place where I didn't talk to the mentor, that is the first place where I went. And it was really like, it was really bad. And I had to change to go somewhere else. So campus visit definitely helped because I talked to my mentor and like Dr. Valdez said, my mentor, he recommended me to talk to other people like in the department to see if I find somebody else like I can work better with. And uh, he was right because at the end, he's not even the person I'm working with today. I'm working with someone else. I'm having a great experience. And uh, seriously, I wish, I really wish before the campus visit or after, I would have asked them to send me some paper to read, to do exactly like the kind of research they do, and they, if they even like the number of publications and where they publish. I wish I did it before and af or after. Thanks, Rod. Uh, Kayla? Probably the most important thing I learned from campus visits is how my perspective box interacts with the department and how the department interacts with each other. You know, in I'm in biology and a lot of our work is really collaborative. I, you know, you have a committee with multiple faculty and you really want to make sure that the, your PI interacts well with their department. They have good relationships and they have good relationships with graduate students and you can really see that when you're in person. And it's definitely made a difference in my graduate program, having a PI that has really um, great people skills and really strong relationships with our department. Uh, but one thing I really wish I asked, which I'm glad I know now because now I'm on the, I'm interviewing for postdocs, kind of that next stage. I feel like I'm interviewing for grad school all over again. Um, but one thing I ask every graduate student is, with everything you've gone through in this program with this PI, would you still pick them if you could go back and do it all over again? Because, you know, people, things happen, life happens, you know, relationships aren't perfect between two individuals or multiple individuals, but knowing that they would go back and still choose the same person over again with everything um, is a really important, it, it, it says a lot about the PI and your perspective lab. Thanks, Kayla. I'm sensing a theme. So the PI and the mentorship is pretty important. Um, Maria. So before I interviewed, someone told me, I don't remember who it could have been Dr. Valdez and it could have been another student, was to ask people who aren't in the labs that you're planning on applying to what their lab is like because if their advisor sitting over them or someone who's likely to go back to the PI and tell on them, then they might not be as open about talking about their own advisors. But if you ask other labs, hey, are those students typically happy? You'll get a lot more honest answers. And I think that helped me a lot because I asked um, some people outside of the lab that I'm in now, how are they? And they were like, oh, they're really chill. They get along. Um, they're always having fun, but they're getting work done. And that um, made me feel really comfortable with going. Um, one thing that I wish that I had asked is, I wish I had asked some of the older grad students, like what are, what are the hardest parts of working with this advisor? Um, less, so I just to be a little bit more prepared of how like you go into a meeting or how you approach an advisor or what state do you give them your drafts in to get the best comments. Um, mm -hmm. I think that would have been super helpful because there are just some things that I didn't know about my advisor going in that I had to learn with time that later when I talk to older grad students, they're like, oh, you didn't know that. So I would ask just for like life lessons from older grad students because a lot of the times they're very open to giving them. 
Okay, thanks, Maria. And Elon? Yeah, um, I really enjoyed um, the campus visits. I think it gave me a better feel of what to expect when I'm on when I was on the campus. Um, I I think um, hearing directly from the students that are in the program, you won't really get that from any other research that you do um, beforehand. So um, that's just a little insight that I would suggest them um, keeping in mind. So thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, we've talked a little bit about this and, and several of our panelists have already touched on this, but exploring the resources. So this is kind of, um, if you think back to that uh, uh, slide that we had with the circle of things and your graduate schools in the, in the middle, um, this was that other care, uh, category. Um, so exploring the resources. So you wanna find out how can the program department or and school and or school um, support you? And so um, it can be through a number of different things so it might be actual physical spaces do they have a graduate student center um, so a space on campus that's just for graduate students and not for undergrads and not for medical students and that's for the PhDs and the master students that's for you um, to interact with each other to do social things um, you know etc um, or do they have a multicultural um, or affinity centers um, to support students of color um, and um, and and um, um, I guess, and are those resources open to graduate students, right? So um, it's not that just that they have them, but they're also open to you. Um, or are there offices um, uh, that will support you, such as a diversity and inclusion office, um, LGBTQ office, a first generation office? So um, are there offices that are for, um, you know, that match your identities um, and that are there to support you through your time in graduate school. Um, student groups was one way that, um, you know, I really found um, beneficial as a graduate student. So the affinity groups were really important for me um, as a graduate student, having that outlet of other students of color who um, understood my experience and, and a space where I could just be and not have to explain um, or not have to keep quiet um, and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, things like a Black Student Association, a Latinx students, um, students of color, um, uh, students of color in STEM, um, uh, women in STEM, etc. So um, there's a number of different groups like that that might be on your campus. And so you want to find out what those groups are and if they're active. Um, so active is very important. Um, is there tutoring available? So, um, you know, graduate school is very hard. None of our panelists have said that, but it is. Um, and, and the coursework is hard and it's a different level than undergrad and that's to be expected. And it doesn't matter what school you go to, if it's a top ranked school um, or, um, you know, what school it is, it's going to be harder than undergrad, um, and that's just the nature of it. Um, and so there is no shame in asking for help. That is my number one piece of advice to students going to graduate school is ask for help. Um, and that may include tutoring. I, I did tutoring, I went to Harvard. I needed tutoring, right? I needed help in my graduate courses and that's okay. And I did fine, I graduated, it's fine. Um, and so feel free to use those resources, find out if they're free and available to you as a graduate student. Um, find out if there's funding or or support for student parents. So if you have a family, if you already have children, um, or if you're thinking about having children during graduate school, know what those resources are um, going into the program. And then also are there married or partnered student housing? Um, so if you are coming to school with a significant other, um, is there housing for you um, that would help you know, accommodate you and your partner? Um, so those are some things just to think about. And so I think I have a question here for our panelists to ask them about what, the, what resources were most important to them as they selected their graduate programs. Um, so um, I'm going to just call on you. Um, let's go Kayla. Um, for me, a really big part of my undergraduate was going to conferences and networking there. Um, I, there, were, there were a decent amount of resources for um, underrepresented students on my university, uh, but I'm Pacific Islander. There, you rarely find Pacific Islanders on this side of the country, and I kind of knew what I was getting myself into coming from the West Coast. And so it was really important to me to be able to know that I could travel to conferences like Sockness, uh, where I could I have that sort of community. And so for me, that that was, I found a whole network of mentor outside of graduate school, knowing that I had that avenue uh, with, with my university. 
Thanks. Uh, Maria, because I can see you. <laughs> This is one of my um, wish I news actually. So I was super excited going to Virginia Tech because on the websites there were, um, they advertise a lot of affinity groups. So like multi multicultural centers in the student center, like entire rooms and stuff that were like an LGBTQ room, a Latinx room and things like that. And people really advertised that. And then I got here and one, a lot of the organizations advertised just are dead organizations. They haven't had people leading them in years and then um, additionally, Dr. Valdez brought up, do they support, do they invite grad students or just undergrads? And they did tell me that they invited undergrads and grad students, but the resources in those resource centers specifically aren't really designed for grad students at all. They don't really have a lot of grad students. So I went to a few things and it just wasn't quite the conversations that I needed. Um, so maybe if you're looking at those types of affinity groups and wondering like, hey, maybe this could be right for me, you ask, I would have asked like, how many grad students do you actually have here? And then I also have um, a lot of intersecting identities, as I've mentioned, and I found out that um, things like the LGBTQ Center doesn't really get, get along at all with other centers, and it's just, I don't fit in. I'm not a good fit for that center at all. Um, but I did discover through other people when I started talking to grad students, I was like, am I um, just being really picky? Is this uh, universally, universal experience, I discovered that it was, and there are different groups to join for grad students that are less well advertised, so now I'm participating more in, the, in those. So I would go to, rather than just looking for like a general affinity group, ask grad students holding multiple identities specifically what supports you and what doesn't support you. Thanks, Maria. Those are great, great points. Uh, Rod. Uh, Personally, when I came to this school, I was not really looking for uh, any of those resources. But coming once I got here, yeah, I saw that they have uh, a multicultural center and uh, there was a Black Graduate Student Association that I joined, but it wasn't really supported by like the faculties up to until last year, because last year we started getting some people involved. There is an, uh, one LGBT center, but I've never been to any meeting. And at the library, there is like a, a whole space only for grad students. You cannot get there if you do not have a key. And every grad student, they give you a key. When you get accepted, you come here in the program. Very cool. And personally, uh, the resource I really enjoy so far since I'm here. Growing up in Europe, I really like soccer. So the graduate student, the biology graduate student, soccer team, even if we never won. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We, we suck. We just do science. So <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Thanks, Rod and Elon. Were there yes, any uh, Yeah, I'm kind of like Kayla. Um, I think that the conferences and um, different networking events were really crucial for getting those connections. Um, and I think on campus, um, just getting connected with different groups, um, like organizations that you're interested in. Um, for example, when I was an undergrad, I um, established a chapter called Engineering World Health because I was super interested in connecting the two, engineering and um, global health. Um, and so through that, I also getting um, connections and getting more resources. Um, also, my faith is a huge part of me and um, finding a graduate school, graduate student Christian association was um, really cool um, at the campuses that I visited. Um, so just finding um, different groups like that was um, encouraging for me. And I think it's a good way to network with people even for future jobs. Thanks, Elon. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the last thing I just wanna say is thank your recommender. So remember that after you have gone through all of this and you have um, you know, been admitted to these programs and you make your decision, you know, even before you make your decision on where you're going, be sure to thank your recommenders and keep them updated on what programs that you've been admitted to 
Um, and um, I always recommend doing handwritten cards. Um, that I think is the best practice. Um, and then I always, of course, say candy and chocolate optional. Um, uh, so, you know, always think about throwing in a box of chocolates or some candy if you know them, you know, whatever's their favorite, they're your advisor. Um, you know, feel free to do that, but it's always optional. Um, but the cards, I think, are really nice touch. And those are things that as, as a mentor and, and advisor to many students, those are the things that I hold on to. I have a very special box that I keep these in. And on the bad days, I open that box up. Um, and I remember all of these amazing students that I've worked with. And I'm so thankful to have those cards and to have those um, reminders of their, their experience and their um, journey th through their um, academic progress. So um, with that, I want to thank our wonderful panelists um, for all of their wisdom that they have shared with us and, and sharing all of their personal stories and being vulnerable with us um, this evening. Um, and so thank you to Maria, Elon, Kayla, and Rod. Um, you all are just a fantastic all-star um, all-star panel and so I'm so grateful to have been able to work with you all tonight. Um, I hope that you all who are you've stayed with us. Um, I see that we still have 45 people here with us so thank you. We're 30 minutes over and I'm so sorry um, but um, thank you for staying with us because this is just incredible content from these panelists um, and so I hope that you will stay in contact with me. Um, this is my website and email and um, I'm on all the social media um, and and, um, not exactly active, but semi-active. And when you write to me, I will be active. Um, and then um, I also always want to give um, acknowledgement to my uh, student, Tulani, uh, who did this drawing for me um, that made me into a cool cartoon. Um, so thank you all. Um, if anybody has questions, we're here. Just raise your hand and we can call on you. I know some of you will have to go because we're well over time, but um, I think our panelists would be willing to stick, stick around for a few more minutes um, for any questions you all have. And Brian, I can't see the, the raise your hand. Siva. Please help us. Yep. Uh, Siva. Yes, hello, Siva. Uh, Siva, sorry. Uh, um, so my question is actually about uh, preparing to apply to grad school. How do you find professors that are doing research you might be interested in? Like, how do you begin that search? Any of our panelists want to take a stab or I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. I can start. Um, yeah. When I first started the summer before, I got super overwhelmed and then like closed it for a month. Um, don't be like that. It's not that overwhelming. Um, ask, always ask. Um, I actually found out about my advisor from my summer advisor at Oregon State University um, who recommended actually just like a lot of people. And as Dr. Velda said a little bit earlier, the academic world is super small. Even if you ask someone that you trust that you that maybe is completely out of the field that you're interested in. They might know someone who knows someone and we all love emails. Um, ask grad students, ask just people that you know. Um, maybe we all love emails is a little bit overselling it, but we all love emails saying, I'm super interested in your work. How did you find those people? That makes um, especially grad students feel really good about ourselves. <laughs> um, so just ask a lot you can google but i think the least overwhelming way to do it is to ask and get direct recommendations when how do you then find or begin to find those grad students like what what platform would you use to find grad students research or anyone's research yeah mm -hmm. You can ask your professors to ask their former students or um, academic Twitter is huge. As soon as I got here, I never did Twitter or a whole lot of social media before. As soon as I got here, my advisor and my mentor told me to make a Twitter and I have met so many people on Twitter doing so much cool research. Also, if you're here, you already have people that you can ask. Um, I know Dr. Valdez put her email up on one of the slides and a couple of us has, are, have already put emails. Um, into the chat, um, but you have you already have great resources at your disposal, and just don't be scared. It's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah, and Something then also I wanted to add. Oh, go ahead, Erin. Um, is um, to use LinkedIn. So if your profile is up to date on LinkedIn, um, you can just easily search keywords in 
um, in the search bar at the top and um, or even just find one faculty that you that you think that you would enjoy working under and then um, see their connections. Um, just kind of using that as a networking tool is, has been amazing for me. So, Yeah. But the last thing I would add is, um, you know, the papers that you read of the projects that you are most interested in, look up what institutions that those authors are at um, and then start looking at that department to see if there's, you know, three faculty there that you'd be interested in working with, right? The papers that you're most excited about is the research that you're most excited about. So that's another way to start narrowing down the schools and identifying some schools that might be of interest for you. Do we have I any? Also, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I also use conferences and uh, since we are, a lot of conferences are virtual now and a lot less expensive, um, it might be easier to get to some conferences. And so I looked at posters and I wrote down the people that I thought were really interesting and I was able to actually talk to the presenters about their lab in person right there. And so conferences can be really powerful for that too. That's great. Thanks for that. Brian, do we have other questions, hand raised? No, no more hands raised, but I do want to say thank you so, so, so much. You guys are wonderful tonight. I think this was a lot of wonderful information, and I do really hope that our students uh, take advantage of your connections uh, and relationships they can build with you, and um, at the end of the day, information is really important <laughs> and so you have people that are willing to give you information so please take advantage of it uh, i do want to thank our collaborators um, for this summer series we're nine down one more to go so dr valdez we'll see you again uh here soon um and next week it's about funding graduate school so it definitely is a perfect transition based off of um tonight's uh feedback and uh, then we'll do one last question from Ryan and then Dr. Valdez, I'll have you close us out tonight. Uh, right. Ryan, do you want to ask your question there? Oh, and went down. <laughs> All right, Dr. Valdez, you wrap us wait, up. Wait, and, oh, 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 sorry. I, I thought I, I thought I unmuted. Sorry. No problem. Um, so I talked to one of my professors not too long ago about transferring uh, or if not about transferring um, before I transferred and it was about um, getting your PhD before getting your master's like just kind of skipping it by doing research is that super hard to do or unheard of? like he said it's possible but he didn't really say how difficult it was yeah um, so uh, there are many uh, programs that you apply directly from your bachelor's degree oh, yeah. um, to the PhD I some curiosity about what life could bring um, there's, uh, there's um, a number of programs, uh, you know, that you can apply to directly from the bachelor's uh, to the PhD. Um, some of them you actually earn a master's along the way uh, once you've completed your coursework and um, the requirements for becoming a PhD candidate, um, you actually get a master's. And um, I have, you know, I know folks who actually walk at the master's degree ceremony um, and do the graduation as kind of a milestone along the way to the PhD, but they never formally applied to a master's degree. Um, so that's very possible possible um, and fairly common in STEM um, because, uh, you know, the master's degrees are typically funded, um, which are, uh, are I should say, um, they typically cost money um, to go to the master's degree where the PhD is funded um, and they provide funding for you. So doing the master's can be really costly to you. Um, and so um, if you can get in directly into the PhD program, I, I say go for it. Um, what about like the co-terminal programs? I don't, I've looked at a few of those, but I don't know if there's any like specific benefit to them. What are like your guys' thoughts on those? Which, like an example? Um, the one I was looking at was a sustainability program at Stanford and it is a joint MA and MS program. And was it funded or it was the cost for both? Um, I'm not sure I have to look into it more. Do you think it, I guess, if it's like partially funded, is it worth it to do something like that? Oh, uh, that's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> and, and very individual. So, um, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, joint programs, um, you know, when when it meets the needs, you know, 
I, I always think about what's the, what's the end goal? Like, what, what do you want to do after you get these degrees? Um, and, and are both degrees necessary? Um, so, so kind of matching up the education for what you want to do in your future life. Um, and of course, that might change. And I uh, can certainly say that my career path has changed a number of times um, since, you know, where I started and thought I would be when I entered graduate school. Um, but I would say, you know, you want to make sure that, that the training is necessary for the job that you hope to do and um and then you know also do some some you know heavy reflection on you know how much do you think you um you know if you are going to have to take out loans how much do you think you can afford and um and will your career support you actually paying that off um or if you're going to be in some type of service work um you know might you be able to get loan forgiveness um because of that service um so um yeah All right. Well, Dr. Valdez, if you just uh, close us out and we'll see everyone next week here. All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being with us and, and especially again to these panelists um, who are just absolute all stars. And um, I am, you know, uh, grateful to get to know Kayla and Rod through this. And I hope that we are going to continue having lots of conversations, um, both about your research and about um, your trajectory um, and, and grateful for Maria and Elon, who've been students of mine, um, for agreeing to be part of this and sharing their everyone for sharing their stories. Um, they're just so you all are so inspiring and um, you know you make me want to do it all over again so um, I hope that all of our uh, students that are participating and, and here with us today feel the same and so thank you all